welcome everyone to uh, you know QHack and to this talk. It's a you know, my pleasure to be uh, presenting some of our more recent, I guess, research work uh, to to the audience. Before I get into that, I just wanted to acknowledge my exceptional group of uh, students, postdocs, undergrads, affiliates with companies, uh, and so on, who work with us both at the University of Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute in our combined effort that we call the Perimeter Institute Quantum Intelligence Lab, or PICL, as you can tell by the color of our hoodies. So on the left there uh, is the most you know, recent uh, photo that we were able to take of our group in person. This is kind of in a lull uh, uh, you know, pandemic lull in the summer there. Uh, and so too many students to acknowledge and uh, too many postdocs. Thank you everyone for all your great work. On the right, upper right, you'll see our space, the original pickle space uh, that was in the Communi Communitech Data Hub here in, uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, you know, uh, before the pandemic. And actually, besides acknowledging all my students and postdocs who I will talk more about during this talk, uh, I also have a group of uh, amazing collaborators that uh, specifically work on uh, you know these rib brigade simulations that I'm going to talk about, uh, and you know just general uh, collaborators and mentors that have been with us throughout the years. First and foremost, Juan Carasquilla at the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, um, you know who uh, is in many ways the genesis of a lot of this work. Uh, over uh, here, you'll see Brian Timar, who was at Caltech at the time that we started this work, uh, working for Manuel Andres in the experimental labs. Uh, he's now at, um, I believe it's SpaceX, you know, so taking our research further to space. Giacomo Torlai, a former student who's now at AWS Quantum, uh, who did a lot of the uh, uh, work on restricted Bolson machines here. And uh, I won't name everybody, but our, we have a great set of collaborators uh, at Harvard and MIT who are working uh, on these Rydberg atom experiments, which are largely still in academia. But before I start with the Rydberg atoms, you know, I just want to embarrass my uh, students and former students by pointing out that we have a long history with uh, QHack. Of course, here is the uh, original 2019 QHack. One of the winners, uh, four of my students, Isaac DeVlute, who's somewhere uh, here, uh, Ijaz Morali, who you'll see a lot of, Matt Beach, and, and handsome Roger Lowe. Uh, 2019, here they are, most likely to achieve quantum advantage. Do you still have that uh, prize category? I'm not even sure. I, I'd like to point out the size of this check. I hope these things have increased over the year. Anyway, you know, this was an amazing, uh, you know, a, amazing project that uh, these four did at the 2019 QHack, and I encourage everyone to check it out because the, you know, the repositories are public, right? The Day Trippers QHack 2019, November 26, Quantum Lottery Ticket to Ride, Green VQE. You know, I, I just looked at this for the first time. Sorry, the second time yesterday, and it, it's really a, a remarkable repository. So. Uh, the whole point is to think about uh, winning tickets, uh, if you will, which are sort of like, I guess it's written here, correct initializations uh, or, uh, you know, pruned networks uh, that actually uh, are expressive sort of beyond what you would imagine. And I think, you know, what's, what's pretty amazing is, is what this, uh, this team of nerds did back in 2019, uh, which was train a 100 layer VQE on the one dimensional spin one half Heisenberg model which is, you know, it's n equals 10 qubits, the Hamiltonian's written there, with 3,000 parameters in the VQE. And then it was pruned down to explore this lottery ticket hypothesis. So, you know, what you could ask back in 2019, what was the, you know, what was the ability of our sort of simulation or classical simulation techniques to do this type of, uh, you know, automatic differentiation through that number of parameters? And, uh, you know, the, they demonstrated uh, the clear winner here. And at that time, I argue, uh, perhaps other, you know, Penny Lane was in development and so on. Uh, but Yao was really one of the only libraries out there uh, that could do this type of automatic differentiation for these sizes. Yao is uh, one of the software uh, projects that uh, Roger Luo was working on, both uh, with our collaborators in China and here at the Pickle, uh, in support, you know, by Chinese uh, organizations, Pickle, and of course the Unitary Fund. I encourage everyone to check it out. It's written in Julia. Sensible, efficient quantum algorithm designed for humans. Remarkable piece of software out of the pickle. Anyway, so I just wanted to brag a little bit about uh, my team and all the amazing things that we're doing. But without further ado, let's get into some physics. So what I've been really interested in lately 
um, for whatever reason, is these Rydberg Atom quantum simulators. And I want to tell you all about that today. Rydberg atoms is, I'll explain what it is, but it really, really these are uh, neutral atoms, okay? So as opposed to something like trapped ions, you can, you can imagine many analogies, I guess, with ionic systems, um, except for the fact that these things don't, these things are neutral. And so a lot of the control uh, elements are very different for, for types of experiments. So what I also like to talk about our current simulation strategies. I think it's very relevant for this, um, this audience. You know, how, how do we, I guess, both characterize and design, uh, you know, rib atom experiments, uh, you know, how do we validate their performance uh, and, and, and so on. And so I'll talk a little bit about our current strategies, some of our software, which again, I'm, I wanna emphasize throughout this talk is, is kind of the role that open source software plays. Um, and in particular, some of our, uh, you know, more recent work on neural network inspired uh, wave functional. Uh, and then I'll finally, a little bit of maybe perspective or speculation at the end, uh, where I'll talk about what, what do we do with, with Rydberg Atom data? Okay, so uh, data-driven strategies uh, and, you know, maybe tease a little bit um, of certain avenues towards quantum advantage uh, in Rydberg Atom system. So what is a Rydberg Atom array? Thank you for asking, Roger. It's an array of neutral atoms. Um, basically, that's it. And what is an array? It could be a regular lattice. It could be a graph. Uh, it's it, it, there's basically an arbitrary um, number of options for what these arrays look like. The neutral atoms that experimentalists, and by the way, I'm not one of them. I'm a theoretical physicist, a dense matter physicist, actually. But what, what are the, the atoms that the experimentalists actually load uh, into these experiments are some sort of isotopically pure rubidium, strontium is a popular one, or some of the rare earths, I think a terbium uh, has been loaded into arrays recently. And you know, it's really a remarkable piece of technology uh, that, that results in, the, in these experiments. I mean, if you think of laser cooling and trapping, if you think of, uh, you know, I think it was, this, the same year Donna Strickland won her Nobel Prize, uh, one of her co-recipients won a Nobel Prize for optical tweezers. All of these things are now put together into these really remarkable devices uh, that on the, on the right here, kind of a schematic illustration of, you know, optical tweezers, you know, I guess the green, uh, you know, holding individual atoms. Uh, and then those individual atoms uh, can be, you know, addressed and read out, um, you know, with, with uh, all sorts of uh, highly... I would say efficient control mechanisms. So what makes the Rydberg and the Rydberg atom? It's the fact that, uh, you know, atoms can be in their ground state. Okay, if it's a rubidium 87 or whatever, you know, it can be cooled into its ground state, use laser cooling, or it can be, you know, uh, pulsed or excited with a, a laser, uh, which brings the, the electron into a very high or very large principal quantum number. And that's what we call a Rydberg state. Okay, so these big balls here, uh, you know, are supposed to be two atoms in their Rydberg state. So like N equals 100 roughly or something like that. So the remarkable thing about uh, Rydberg atoms is once they're in this Rydberg state, uh, you know, there's a di you know, there's a single electron kind of orbiting around at this large radius, and it tends to be very susceptible to forming a dipole, uh, you know, dipole moment, okay? And so when you have two of these things near enough, you get a very strong sort of dipole-dipole interaction. That's arising from this electric dipole moment. And that's what gives, uh, you know, you access to a strongly interacting you know, quantum system. It's a two-level system. These things are qubits, ground state and excited state. Uh, they're strongly interacting. Uh, you know, they can be prepared in all sorts of different states and they can be imaged. So single atom resolved uh, fluorescent imaging uh, provides essentially the equivalent of projective measurement. Okay, so a little bit more detail. What is, I guess, the Hamiltonian that these things uh, evolve under? I've just written it, it here. So again, two-level system, ground state, Rydberg state. Here's a Hamiltonian. Uh, you know, there's an off-diagonal uh, matrix element, if you will, or an off-diagonal operator, uh, which takes atoms in their ground state, cites them, or vice versa. Okay, and, and so that's uh, that's basically the Rabi, uh, you know, the Rabi frequency omega that that uh, is involved there's a detuning uh, another parameter which you know n is the occupation of the Rydberg state so you can favor many Rydberg's atoms or, or few Rydberg's atoms depending on the value of delta 
And there's an interaction which I talked about, which arises from dipole dipole interactions, which has a van der Waal form here, uh, basically one over R6. And so because of this van der Waal type interaction, uh, you know, you can't have, or there's an energy penalty uh, for two Rydberg, you know, excited atoms uh, that are too near to each other. Okay. So N, I, N, J, there's a one over R6. And this is called the, the blockade in some sense. So this blockade Hamiltonian has been studied, you know, upwards of 20 years now, since kind of early 2000s by all sorts of remarkable scientists, Sirach, Zoller, Misha Lukin, uh, and Paul Fenley, Subir Sachdev looked at these things theoretically. And basically, they're very rich, very interesting interacting systems uh, and that can be described by uh, all, even simpler Hamiltonians that you know just include the blockade. So here's a the red is a Rydberg atom. You know maybe this is its kind of uh, Rydberg radius or blockade radius. And basically, what this Hamiltonian is saying that there's a huge energy penalty for having two atoms excited, you know, into the Rydberg state uh, simultaneously. That geometry crucially affects the physics. And that's really how uh, all sorts of interesting, uh, you know, um, uh, I guess, physical states and so on are prepared uh, using this blockade Hamilton. I mostly work with data that comes from Misha Lukin's uh, experimental lab um, at Harvard. And it, much of his apparatus was built by Manuel Andres, who I mentioned is now at Caltech. So these are very academic sort of uh, uh, efforts uh, currently. Here's an example of, you know, here's a schematic of Misha's setup where you have optical tweezers in a vacuum, you know, basically in a vacuum cell, which are holding the atoms. You have CCD cameras, which take these fluorescent images. And it's a very interesting procedure whereby they make uh, these interacting uh, arrays. There's a probabilistic loading step, okay? So you throw these atoms in, you're, you're laser cooling them, they're trapping them. There's only a certain non-zero probability that you fill the optical tweezers. Uh, there's a very interesting stage of the experiment uh, where you've rearranged uh, all of the, you know, on the left is all the field optical tweezers so that, you know, only the filled ones are left in the array, which is a highly non-trivial algorithm, actually, that uh, some of us uh, at Pickle work on for these, uh, for these groups. Once the uh, optical tweezers are rearranged into a regular lattice with full atomic filling, uh, that Hamiltonian is implemented, which per, uh, performs adiabatic state preparation, giving you some state of interest, which can then be read out, you know, again, through single atom resolved, oops, fluorescent image. Okay, so you get pro projective measurements of atoms in the ground state here, and the excited state, which are these red circles, which are really the absence um, of, a project uh, of a fluorescent image of an atom. There you have your, your, your sort of uh, state preparation, you know, read out, that's a destructive measurement. You know, go back, reload the array, reposition everything, rearrange it, adiabatic state evolution, read out, that's, you know, two, two uh, elements of a projective uh, image data set. Uh, one thing about these, is, uh, uh, these arrays, which is very nice, is there's a high degree of control. I mean, you have these kind of optical tweezers, which can make all sorts of lattices in Two dimensions and you know even three dimensions. So I have a uh, on the on the right here. You see some uh, interesting geometries that have been developed by the French group, including you know if you want uh, a Eiffel Tower shaped array of Rydberg arrays to be used in who knows some application. Anyway, you can kind of get an idea for the state of the art here. Uh, you know these experiments are getting uh, in the regime where they they are basically preparing highly pure states of you know, two, three, four hundred qubits um, and, and, and soon to be even larger. I think these are highly scalable experiments um, that give you very good uh, sort of pure ground state wave, wave function or ground states. So these experimental lattices, you know, anything you can dream up in principle, you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, implementing with this Hamiltonian or related Hamiltonians on all of these uh, variety of lattices. And people have, uh, been sort of studying the phase diagrams of these Rydberg lattice arrays in earnest, I would say. And there's a couple interesting points to make about, uh, you know, what's going on in these experiments. Uh, so that, you know, that stage between rearrangement of the array and a readout is really where all the quantum action happens. 
Uh, typically, states are prepared, ground states are prepared in these experiments using some sort of adiabatic state preparation where the ratio of the detuning, okay, which is the symmetry breaking between the ground state and the rubric state, um, uh, and the Rabi frequency is adjusted as a function of time. And what that does is really, if you look at this two dimensional phase diagram on the left, is it really, uh, you know, the experiments are prepared with everything in its ground state. It's cooled, all the atoms are in its ground state. It's what they call disordered in, in, in these experiments. And then, you know, adiabatically, according to some time scale, uh, you know, the state of the system is typically swept from the disordered state into some ordered state, which could be of interest, you know, to quantum computing or to condensed matter physicists. Uh, and so there's many papers that, uh, you know, explore all sorts of interesting phases and phase transitions in these equilibrium sort of statistical mechanical settings. I think the most intriguing are those recent papers, and I've listed two uh, theoretical papers and one experimental paper at the bottom uh, that propose the existence of topologically ordered states. Okay, so I've just illustrated one point on the phase diagram of this one study. Uh, you know, these are states that can be prepared in Rydberg atom systems uh, that are equivalent to emergent, essentially, Z2 gauge theories or Z2 topological order. So they're emergent toric codes or emergent surface codes, if you will, in some sense. And so it's a very interesting proposition. Uh, I think that Rydberg atom uh, arrays, you know, could possibly be used to prepare states of matter uh, that would be interested in, interesting in terms of topological quantum computing. So, you know, the encoding of logical qubits, right? With a certain amount of overhead of, of, of the physical Rydberg uh, two-level qubits. And of course, you topologically ordered states of the Z2 type of four uh, degenerate ground states, which are used to encode logical qubits. Uh, so, you know, the last paper here, Semigini et al, uh, basically uh, search for a Z2 topological phase uh, using 219 qubits. So you get sort of an idea for uh, you know, the amount of qubits that are uh, possible in, in, you know, state-of-the-art experiments. But it's not just all about, you know, preparing equilibrium states of matter. Uh, you know, the uh, adiabatic state preparation in these experiments itself is a very rich uh, and interesting, uh, I'd say, you know, field of study. Uh, and it's in particular interesting because, uh, you know, the block 8 Hamiltonian that I mentioned uh, is sort of very natural for encoding a certain type of optimization problem, uh, including maximal in independent set problems. Okay, so there's some literature out there in the world where uh, it's, it's fairly clear that there's, uh, you know, a lot of mappings that can occur between, uh, you know, whatever traveling salesman type problems or uh, unit disk type problems into these maximal independent set problems, which can then be attacked uh, using you know, all, all sorts of annealing schedules that are available to these specific quantum experiments. Uh, and so, you know, keep, keep posted for uh, Roger Luo's next paper, which is coming out. Here he is sitting at the pickle talking, I guess, to the, his camera. Uh, you know, in a few days, he tells me a paper's coming out uh, for where uh, maximal independent set uh, uh, physics is explored using Rydberg atom arrays. And by the way, Roger is... Uh, uh, you know, interning at a spin-out company, a, a startup that spun out of Harvard and MIT uh, by Misha and Marcus Greiner and uh, Voltic and others uh, called QERA. Okay, so we have a kind of great relationship with uh, QERA quantum computing in Boston. And I would also point out that, you know, they're not the only game in town. The French group has a very compelling uh, startup effort called Pascal, uh, which is building, again, a rubidium uh, atom I believe it's a rubidium atom uh, Rydberg array quantum computer. And stay tuned because there's more. Uh, you know, the Munich Quantum Valley Initiative uh, coming out of Germany also has as its flagship company, um, a, a, as, as yet un, unpublicly released, uh, you know, a company building a Rydberg array quantum computer using strontium atoms. So, you know, even though it's sort of in some sense a new effort, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of neutral atom or Rydberg atom quantum computing uh, companies coming out in the near future. So that was uh, just an introduction to, I think, the state of the state of the art, state of the field for Rydberg atom simulators. I want to talk a little bit about the work we perform uh, at Pickle on simulation strategies and on data-driven strategies. So first off, 
uh, you know, when you build a uh, quantum computer like this, or when experimentalists build quantum computers like this, there's all sorts of tasks required in terms of, as you might imagine, characterization, validation, design, and so on. Uh, and so our group here at Waterloo is very involved in all, all of these efforts. Uh, so for example, uh, these two fine young gentlemen, Ijaz Morali and Isaac DeVloot, uh, are the chief architects of one of the most compelling simulation suites uh, out there for Rip Regatta uh, Array Quantum Computing. And that's a Quantum Monte Carlo uh, code written in Julia, of course, uh, you know, based on uh, Stochastic Series Expansion uh, QMC efforts. And so just to give you a flavor for what happens in Quantum Monte Carlo, basically equivalent to Worldline type Monte Carlo methods, is the Hamiltonian is broken down into a set of uh, matrix elements, which are placed in a D plus one dimensional expansion of the partition function. Here, I've just shown a very kind of simple schematic of a, of a quantum Monte Carlo simulation cell for four Rydberg atoms, you know, which is being involved uh, in imaginary time, essentially, using the matrix elements on the left. And so that's a effective classical description, okay? And, and under certain cases, like in the Rydberg, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, you know, efficient classical simulation techniques are possible. They're in these cases where you have no sign problem uh, or you have a stochastic Hamiltonian. So we expect efficient uh, sampling of, of essentially, you know, uh, the partition function or of, of Rydberg atom configurations using these types of methods. Uh, so keep your eye for, uh, keep your eye on, uh, you know, these two gentlemen for more um, I think amazing results uh, coming out of Quantum Monte Carlo. And really what Quantum Monte Carlo gives us is the ability to benchmark uh, the, the current and future generations of experiments. Uh, so, you know, uh, we can simulate the current uh, biggest experimental devices in terms of their equilibrium uh, properties. Uh, so I think a major question that I have right now is, you know, at what point uh, will the experiments sort of surpass the ability of Ejaz and Isaac's code. And that will be a benchmark uh, for, in some sense, for quantum advantage uh, in, in the in experiments. And so I just showed some Fourier transforms at the bottom. So I think what's amazing is right now we're really, uh, you know, taking lattices of the same size as the experiment and reproducing uh, the, you know, if you will, the ground state uh, correlation functions uh, to a high degree of accuracy. So we don't just work on, I mean, I, a, uh, in my PhD was on quantum Monte Carlo. It's sort of my uh, favorite technique. Uh, but of course, you know, at Pickle, we do all sorts of things. And one of the large areas of interest for us is neural network based onsaut wave functions. Okay. And uh, this is dating back to work done by Giacomo Torlai uh, way back in 2016 when he first started exploring the famous restricted Boltzmann machines uh, as, as onsaut wave functions for. Uh, uh, you know, for both pure states uh, and also mixed state quantum systems. Uh, so we actually have a open source software uh, suite called Cucumber that was written several years ago uh, that implements uh, restricted Boltzmann machines using Python. Uh, very interesting piece of software. I encourage anyone who uh, wants to explore Boltzmann machines for quantum physics to check it out. Uh, another strategy that we've been uh, pursuing lately is uh, autoregressive models. Okay, so which is uh, you know, which are a, a type of, uh, you know, I would say normalized, if you will, uh, uh, onsaut for wave functions uh, that I really learned, uh, you know, from Juan Kereskija's group uh, at, at, at Vector Institute. Uh, so recurrent neural network can be used uh, to, to represent a, a normalized wave function uh, in a way that maybe is obvious from the schematic. Uh, but, you know, the X here on the, on the right are the inputs of a single projective measurement. And what the recurrent cell gives as an output is the conditional probability of the next, you know, qubit in the sequence. Uh, so very interesting, very compelling uh, uh, new uh, strategies, uh, which I encourage you to look at uh, Mohammed Hibet Allah's uh, GitHub repository if you want to learn more. So uh, both Juan Kereski and, and Jack Motorla have done a lot of work on, or done some really interesting work on using these onsots, these neural network onsots wave functions uh, as variational uh, strategies for simulation of Rydberg systems. Uh, so in this uh, uh, recent paper, how to use neural networks to investigate quantum antibody physics, uh, the pair shows some very interesting results 
uh, for the convergence of the Rydberg Hamiltonian energy, okay, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for certain detuning parameters and so on, uh, as a, you know, as a function of number of hidden units in a recurrent uh, neural network, uh, a recurrent cell, uh, and compared to exact results given by uh, DMRG. And so I think what's important here is not only the fact that I didn't show the size, I believe this is an eight by eight array, uh, not, not only the fact that these variational methods are very powerful, they have no sign problem, um, you know, they uh, give very close matching to, uh, you know, exact uh, energies given to us by DMRG for a variety of parameters, uh, but also that the codes are in some sense very simple, um, you know, if built off sort of pre-existing, uh, you know, libraries like yeah, TensorFlow. Um, and so what's, what's I, be, I believe, very important as a community, and which, which this pair did uh, very nicely in this paper, uh, is, is for all of us to sort of be able to access kind of each other's codes in an open, open access, open source sort of way. So they, they gave very nice kind of code tutorials in this paper, which, you know, if you study this for, uh, you know, only a few days, I think you'll be able to implement your own sort of recurrent net neural network wave function. Uh, that'll give very compelling uh, results for uh, Rydberg Atom array. So those are our kind of, you know, in silico simulation strategies. And in the ne next two minutes, I just want to give an idea for where we're going in the future. And in the future, we want to combine these strategies with data-driven data strategies in the sense that data, you know, coming from the computer, uh, which I believe personally is a very compelling uh, avenue towards quantum advantage. So just as a reminder, you know, the experiment produces projective measurement data. So each one of these vectors of zeros and ones are like the fluorescent images uh, that I showed you previously. And those, of course, are distributed according to the, a Born rule, whatever that probability distribution is. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you can perform tomography, essentially, uh, with you know, neural network wave functions or any, any sort of onsets wave function, uh, given sufficient data. Uh, and using a cost function, some sort of maximum likelihood or some sort of KL divergence, uh, where you aim to match, you know, the P of X, which is the distribution coming from the experiment, you know, with P of lambda, where lambda is the model parameters uh, in whatever your onsets is. And so that's, that's kind of a, you can imagine a data-driven kind of tomographic reconstruction uh, where the wave function is modeled, you know, just in the same way as you might have something like a tensor network, which could be a variational on sorts that you optimize, you know, with knowledge of the Hamiltonian. Uh, these neural networks are very powerful on sorts that can be optimized with data, uh, which hopefully give all sorts of great generalization properties, you know, uh, depending on kind of how much data you have. Uh, and so we've demonstrated the fact that, uh, you know, on real experimental data that comes from uh, the, the laboratory at, at Harvard University, uh, so we've recently uh, demonstrated real uh, accurate reconstruction uh, of sort of one-dimensional uh, Rydberg atom chains. This is before many of the two-dimensional results were available back in 2019. Uh, so for example, here's the Rydberg occupation as a function of detuning. Uh, you can see the experimental versus this is a small enough system we can diagonalize it exactly versus the blue, which is the, uh, in this case, restricted Bolson machine uh, reconstruction. Why do we do this? I mean, you know, any tomographic reconstruction of a wave function is powerful because it gives you access to all sorts of things like off diagonal estimators, which aren't available to, you know, the original uh, experimental setup, for example. And we've explored a lot of ways of getting off the angle and uh, other information out of these reconstructions uh, and fed back information to the experiments. So for example, here's an off the expectation value of the off the angle operator in the Hamiltonian isn't directly accessible from the fluorescent imaging. And we can look for discrepancies like we found here in order to advise, I guess, the experiments uh, about what's going on. But that's when you have you know, you know, informationally complete data. One thing about Rydberg atom arrays is that they actually have a high uh, sh uh, shot budget, or you know, it's, it's difficult to get a lot of measurements. Here we use 3,000 projective measurements, but it's on an eight or nine qubit system. So it's essentially informationally complete. Uh, you know, typical experiments give you about one shot a second, two shots a second. Uh, and so what happens when you have a limited amount of data, uh, you may not be able to reconstruct uh, the wave function accurately, uh, like I show on the left-hand side here. Here's a 12 by 12 Rydberg array. 
where we have a thousand measurements and I've tried to reconstruct, uh, tried to get a good variational energy um, using, uh, using a cost function like the KL diversion. And you can see what happens. It's a little hard to see, but generally as I increase the number of hidden units, uh, my trend here is that, you know, I get some sort of minimum and as I keep training, I basically start to overfit. So like the purple line is 40 hidden units uh, for a 12 by 12 array, achieve some minimum, uh, but the, the network overfits and you get a very uh, big energy error. So just as a kind of final motivation for, I would say, ideas in quantum supremacy or quantum advantage using a limited amount of experimental data, uh, we can imagine taking the same wave function on sorts and optimizing the thing variationally. So instead of with data, with knowledge of the Hamiltonian, okay, which is some sort of a priori knowledge, but you know, uh, the idea is that this is how typical in silico simulations are done. So here's a variational, here's that same variational optimization. Uh, recurrent neural network in this case is started out with some random weights. Uh, you know, you variationally optimize the thing. You hope to get a decent ground state energy. The black is the exact. It's doing all right, but you know, it doesn't seem like it's gonna get there uh, maybe in reasonable times. What do we do with limited experimental data that's not informationally complete? Uh, well, one great sort of demonstration of the power of this data is to take the initial data, train uh, the same neural network uh, with the data that comes from the experiment, which is in principle the orange here. And, but you know, before the overfitting starts to occur, switch the cost functions from maximum likelihood driven by data to uh, you know, a variational cost function uh, at, at whatever step, you know, maybe near the minimum. And as you can see, between the difference between the green and the blue, you can get vast improvements in the time to convergence uh, of your algorithm using this hybrid method. So I think this is a really you know, compelling and interesting uh, uh, sort of avenue um, where we've essentially devised hybrid algorithms that are dependent on uh, you know, neural network onsets that can be trained both with data and variationally and combine the two uh, to get performance, you know, simulation performance, if you will, uh, that you know, uh, individually would be impossible. So that's basically my whole pitch. Uh, you know, quantum simulation with river atom arrays. If you haven't heard about it before, you know, it's because it's new in some sense, but it's not that new because people have been working on it for 20 years. So 20 years seems to be kind of the sweet spot, uh, you know, where we're now really getting some uh, really impressive experiments that are giving us some really interesting data. Um, and I just expect more and more coming out of this field in the future. There's, I think, several interesting ideas for quantum advantage in these devices. Uh, number one, kind of what I told you, hybrid type algorithms, but number two, uh, you know, new avenues for quantum uh, adiabatic state preparation, quantum annealing, different different annealing schedules are possible in these things than say, you know, superconducting quantum circuit uh, devices like D-Wave and so on. Uh, so, uh, keep, you know, stay tuned for that. And just as a final note, you know, things like we're doing today and this week, uh, you know, building uh, communities that support open source software, uh, you know, the development of open source codes like Yao, Cucumber, PastaQ, which is uh, Giacomo Torlai's uh, circuit simulator based on tensor network methods. Uh, you know, I think these play a crucial role, uh, both in the, you know, work that you all are doing, uh, but also, you know, importantly for the hardware developers, uh, like these Ripper Gatum people uh, who are building the real experiment. Uh, you know, so thanks every everyone out there for all your efforts. Uh, you know, congratulations, Xanadu, for a, a great hackathon. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Nathan, back to you. Amazing. Thanks so much, Roger. I, I do. I, you must be a, a hungry guy. I noticed all the the projects and software are named after food somehow. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so actually, I want to I want to continue on the subject of uh, where you started, which was with your students and your group. So you know, your students have uh, you've you've had a few generations of students probably by now, and they've gone on to different careers. And I know. Uh, having gone through it myself as a grad student, sometimes there's this uncertainty about an academic path versus an industry path. And I know you, you mentioned some of your students have had you know, successful landings in industry. Where do you see that's kind of evolving right now, the, ac the academic versus the industry career path for students? It's a good uh, question. When I graduated in uh, 2005 you know, with my PhD, there certainly were not as many career paths available to me 
in industry. I mean, it's, 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 you know, to me, it was very obvious. Uh, you know, if I wanted a job doing this type of research, it essentially had to be in academia. And so then, uh, I, you know, I went to Oak Ridge National Lab. I came back to Canada, um, uh, to uh, University of Waterloo and Perimeter. So that was 2007. And since 2007 to now, you know, there's been a, a huge increase in the opportunities for specifically, I'd say, the research that we do and, you know, the research that my students do in industry. Uh, so, I mean, that's a very different landscape in terms of, uh, you know, their career paths uh, than it was a few years ago. And I think, uh, you know, part of it is, you know, because of great companies like yours, right, that uh, have positions that are, you know, exactly in this field. Um, uh, you know, the, available of, uh, the availability of capital for people who are interested in starting their own startups and so on. And I guess, you know, I can't remember what the question is, but just to ramble on one more point. I think, uh, I think we're, you know, it's up to us to be sort of good stewards of the field in some sense, right, to make sure that, uh, you know, all of these opportunities that are out there for our, you know, students and postdocs and so on, you know, continue to be, uh, I'd say, available in, in, in the future and that we're not sort of blowing up hype bubbles and so on. And I think we're all well aware of that in the quantum computing field. So I would say, you know, good job, generally, everyone uh, in being good stewards to, uh, to the field. For sure. Maybe continuing on the subject of, of industry, I know you're, uh, you know, you work with the Creative Destruction Labs Quantum Stream. You know, what role do you see entrepreneurship playing in uh, the, the evolution of the field? Entrepreneurship is very important because it provides incentive, uh, I believe, for a lot of the development, uh, you know, both on the hardware side, uh, but also, also on the software and, and sort of theory side of things. If you look back at, you know, the state of, uh, you know, semiconductor, uh, you know, the semiconductor industry, uh, sort of maybe in the 50s or something like that. I mean, there was certainly incentives coming from government and NASA and military and things like that. But there were also, you know, groups of people who were exploring commercial applications for transistors, right? And, you know, I think it's very important that we, uh, again, kind of foster an ecosystem of young entrepreneurs uh, who might have different ideas you know, than, you know, us academics, for example, about what might be, you know, how or how quantum technology may provide value out there. And so I think there's a lot still to be discovered. You know, what, what, what will be the transistor radio, which incentivizes development, you know, further development of qubit technology or something like that, right? I think it's, uh, you know, I think this lies squarely uh, among entrepreneurial people uh, to kind of come up with these incentives. So they, I believe they play a very important role in development of our field. You mentioned a couple of startups, uh, kind of newer companies in your, your talk, uh, Ridbrick Adam Companies. Why do you think, I mean, you did mention it's a 20-year time scale, but why do you think now is the moment for Ridbrick Adam? Is why, why couldn't we have done that 10 years ago? Why, why not five years from now? Anything special has changed in the field? Um, I think a lot of it, I believe, uh, you know, has to do with some of this optical technology. I mean, optical tweezers. You know, Nobel Prize is given for like essentially one optical tweezer. Now it's routine to build arrays of hundreds or nearing thousands of, of optical tweezers, which can all be controlled, you know, via software, a feedback loop that comes from CCD. I mean, that just takes a long time to build, I think, in some sense. I think another, I think another point is, um, uh, you know, I, I believe it's, you know, control, uh, the ability to control the, the development of integrated, uh, you know, hardware software solutions for control. Which of course the experimentalists uh, everywhere are, are sort of experts in. I think I think from the outside sometimes we don't know how how big a role uh, you know computational uh, algorithms and so on play in control and so on. Uh, so I think it's that, and uh, you know I think it's also the development of incentives. Uh, if you want to fund a startup uh, that is based on something like a Rydberg array, you know there has to be a compelling economic incentive. I would say uh, in order for a capital to come. And so what Ridberg arrays have done is, is shown that, uh, you know, there's basically viable incentive, uh, you know, in, in kind of like those two examples I showed maybe, you know, topological quantum states, you know, useful for topological quantum computing or, you know, different avenues of adiabatic state preparation. You see those two things, you're like, okay, you know, this, is, this makes sense. Uh, I'm going to put some money into these startups and see what comes up. Nice. 
So, so Roger, we do like also here at QHack to, to kind of understand the scientists behind the science. So I'm going to maybe take a little bit of a turn here. You shared with me that you spent a lot of time in, in northern Manitoba, and I hope I get this right, the PAW. Is that it? That's right, the PAW. The, the PAW. So tell us, you know, what do you like up there? What, 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 what do you see in that landscape or that, that area? Well, let's see, it's probably the flattest uh, part of planet Earth. Uh, you know, it's like 400 feet above sea level uh, and connected to Hudson Bay through a whole bunch of rivers and so on, which are frozen most of the year, uh, you know, with temperatures that routinely uh, get below minus 40 Fahrenheit or Celsius. Uh, but <laughs> that's a fairly sparsely populated part of the country, uh, you know, uh, full of strays like myself. Um, but, you know, it's very beautiful, uh, very rugged landscape. Uh, I spent a lot of time outdoors up there. Uh, you know, fishing, hunting, trapping, snowmobiling, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so it's really my home away from home when I'm not at Waterloo. Any any good hunting stories you could share with us? I could, but, you know, a lot of my students are vegans, and I've, I've learned to become <laughs> a little more sensitive to that. I mean, I'm a vegetarian. I don't mind. <laughs> oh, let's, let's just say that I try to get out every year uh, and, and obtain at least source at least one or two hearts uh, for my students and postdocs to eat at the uh, you know annual pickle party that we call Heartsmith. Put it that way. Everyone watching is invited. To the next Heartsmith, whatever that is. Hope you like to eat. Legendary. Is that is that uh, where your um, is that held at the same spot as your group photo there with the antlers that I saw in the background? That's my that's my yard here in Waterloo, which I try to you know I got antlers, I got all sorts of skins and rugs and so on, just to you know so I don't get homesick. Yeah, very interesting. Roger, why don't we jump into some questions from the chat? I'll make sure we get uh, some time for all of these. So question from, uh, question here, why are neutral atom platforms considered quantum simulators and not quantum computers? Semantics. I mean, what's a simulator? What's an emulator? These things, um, you know, the Hamiltonian I showed is, you know, has some relationship to standard uh, models that we study in, say, condensed matter, like the transverse field Ising model. And so when I see a quantum computer that can prepare, uh, you know, basically the ground states of some you know, model of interest, you know, I, I call that a simulator, but maybe you're emulating it or something like that. And I think the main point is that, you know, uh, like, you know, some of these models that we study, especially in condensed matter, materials, physics, or quantum chemistry, you know, they're modeling systems that we don't have any control of or don't have much control of uh, that are provided by nature. Whereas these computers that are being built are highly controlled. You know, they're built with, you know, ex exceptional control. And so really, in some sense, you know, a computer is a highly controlled device that's programmable, right? These things are analog in some sense, but once you have error correction and so on, they become, I want to call it digital. So yeah, these are analog computers that are used just you know, that are highly controlled and used to emulate or simulate other systems of interest in nature. Fair enough. Maybe maybe this can be a, a follow-up question then that kind of spins off that one. So from AB Quant, the question is, can your Rydberg simulator be used in both analog adiabatic mode or annealing and universal gate-based mode? I mean, certainly the former is much more near term than the latter. Um, I, I, I believe if you talk to the experimentalists, I don't want to put words in their mouth, that they have ideas to turn these things into universal uh, gate-based machines. Um, but I would argue that they're not, you know, they're not there yet. I think there's still a lot to be discovered. But on the other hand, you know, they're very different platforms than some of the ones that we're used to. And so I think anything could happen here. Enough people get interested and start working on these uh, devices. Um, I'm sure that there's avenues to full fault tolerant gate-based quantum computing with these. So all the right ingredients are there? I think so. Cool. Another question, this is more going back towards the uh, more theory side. So how does, how does the neural network wave functions compare to quantum Monte, quantum Monte Carlo in terms of resource efficiency, uh, the affliction of the sign problem, and accuracy? Good questions. Um, if you can use quantum Monte Carlo, the rule of thumb is you should use it. Uh, and then again, and again, that's for equilibrium uh, statistical mechanical properties, okay? Because it's like, you know, you're simulating in some sense the partition function or the, the zero temperature, you know, Euclidean path integral or whatever you want to call it. 
Um, so typically they scale linearly in, in the space time volume of, the, of that, you know, imaginary time circuit, if you want to call it that, which is very efficient, right? So in practice, of course, there can be all sorts of details that, that kind of uh, leak in there or sort of pre-factors that might affect that scaling. Uh, the variational methods like the neural network wave functions or other variational methods, they in some sense have an advantage because they have, a, you know, they have an explicit onsots for the wave function uh, that you're basically training network parameters on and so on. And there's no sign problem there. Uh, but the, you know, the resource efficiency can be hidden in that optimization. How do you optimize all these parameters to give you, you know, the global minimum? And that, you know, that's a little bit trickier uh, to sort of address. I think generally, you know, the best kind of methods still are uh, one-dimensional DMRG or quasi-one-dimensional DMRG-based uh, optimization methods where you have a deterministic algorithm. But I would also argue that some of these new architectures, particularly the autoregressive models that they're looking at at the Vector Institute, uh, will give uh, DMRG uh, run for its money if, if they're not already. So keep your eye on those. Awesome. Maybe if I could ask a question again on the on the Rydberg side. So what is the biggest challenge that you foresee that they need to overcome to kind of break through to the next level? The biggest challenge right now is, I, I think, I gather, you know, the probabilistic loading of the array. So you have a 50% chance that every optical tweezer gets an atom in it. Then you got to rearrange this into some sort of crazy lattice. That step, which is like a, you know, an image, take a CCD image, and then you have to come up with an algorithm to move all of the optical tweezers. That seems to have a non-trivial scaling uh, associated with it. So it's really very much a control, uh, a control issue. Uh, but I think that's really one of the bottlenecks right now, uh, kind of in the in the uh, in the state preparation or, or or you know in the multi, you know if you need multiple shots, this is kind of the thing, one of the bottlenecks. So a very interesting computational problem in the control. Do you have a sense of what the actual scaling might look like, or just do you, you're seeing like early data is just becoming very tricky? My my student Roger knows exactly the scaling, but I don't know. Roger, where are you? He'll answer <laughs> it in Twitch. Awesome. Well, I don't know. So maybe one last question here. Um, maybe this is more for increased clarity. It's a question from Increase Entropy. Basically, the question is: uh, Are these Rydberg atom simulators? Universal or not? Can they form a, a Turing machine? Oh, Turing machine. I'd say the current generation of experiments, no, no, they're they're not. As far as I understand, no. Uh, but I don't think there's a a real barrier to that. Uh, you know, give you know if they're able to produce uh, different sets of let's just say gates and so on, which I know all of these experiments are working. But right now, don't count on it. In the next couple of years. Keep your eyes on the literature. There's so many papers coming out right now from academia and these these startups on Rydberg systems. Um, somebody's going to solve these problems for sure. So it's more of a technological challenge than any sort of fundamental scientific obstacle. I would imagine. Great. Fortunately, Roger, we're out of time now. It's been really a pleasure to have you on with us today. Thanks a lot for the great talk and the great uh, answers to all the questions. Absolutely. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, everyone.